my name is Burr Settles, and uh, I, I'm research director at Duolingo. I'm kind of the head of the AI and machine learning group, uh, and in the past also data science and, and learning and curriculum and linguistics also uh, reported up to me at one time, psychometrics. A uh, bunch of different things, and I'm going to talk today about improving language learning and assessment uh, with Duolingo. Now, raise your hand if you're familiar with Duolingo, if you've used it. Okay, good. Raise your hand if you have no idea what Duolingo is. All right, that's also good. Um, just out of curiosity, who's actually used Duolingo to learn uh, another language? What are some of the languages people have been learning? French. Hawaiian. Hawaiian. Exactly, neighbor of mine is supposedly the top scoring Welsh person. Welsh? Welsh is, uh, there are actually more people learning Welsh and Irish on Duolingo than there are native speakers of those languages. <laughs> <clears throat> so whether you, I've, in talking, in meeting with a bunch of students today, I realized not people know the Duolingo origin story, uh, but it actually started as a research project here at Carnegie Mellon. It spun out as a company in 2012. Um, I joined in January of 2013, so I've been there almost nine years. Today, there's more than 500 million uh, learners across the globe learning a variety of different languages. Uh, th these numbers are probably outdated, um, but there's at least 90, I think there's more than 100 courses now, um, and all the learning content is free. Uh, we monetize through a subscription service, which does not put any of the educational content behind a paywall. The subscription service just gives you fun game-like bonuses and things like that, as well as ads and the Duolingo English test, which I'll talk about today. Um, and also, uh, I was around here at Carnegie Mellon at the time that Duolingo started. This is um, a National Science Foundation grant. I started, I was a postdoc with Tom Mitchell in the machine learning department. My very first day, he handed me this LaTeX file and said, here, write a couple of pages in here to help fund your postdoc. And uh, uh, so it was, as you can see, the co-PIs were Luis Von On, who was a professor here at the time and is co-founder uh, of Duolingo. At the time, it was called Monolingo. Because <laughs> the idea wasn't even to teach people other languages. It was actually like a game where you could translate the web as a byproduct of playing this language game. Um, but I didn't work on that part. I worked on the human in the loop systems uh, for this never-ending language learner or read the web project. Uh, and also while I was here, I wrote a textbook on active learning, which was my area of expertise for my thesis. But um, yeah, so I guess this is 12 years ago. Uh, now is the seeds of Duolingo, and I was kind of there, kind of here, even though I didn't work on Duolingo at the time. For those of you who know about Duolingo but haven't used it, here's like a crash course on how it works. We have these game-like lessons grouped into skills by topic, so these can be sets of vocabulary and a theme or particular grammatical concepts that we're trying to introduce. Uh, and learners complete skills to unlock rows. So this is a way that we kind of implement mastery learning. Uh, you have to progress through certain skills before you unlock and are able to learn the new material. Uh, and you're encouraged to level up so once you go through all of the material, kind of at a basic level, at level one, you can go back and review it at level two. So it's the same content, but it's a little harder in the way that it's presented. Uh, and then there's other gamified motivators and metrics like a streak uh, or like an in-app currency that you can use to buy swank champagne jumpsuits for our Duolingo uh, mascot to wear, et cetera. And you know, one thing we're proud of is the Duolingo is used across the whole socioeconomic spectrum. So at least according to this Reddit AMA, uh, Bill Gates uses Duolingo to learn French. Um, the San Jose Earthquakes, the general manager there is from Argentina, doesn't speak much English. Most of the players are American, don't speak much Spanish. So they were using Duolingo to learn English and Spanish to better communicate with each other. Um, Here's a group of kids in Indonesia using Duolingo uh, in their classroom as uh, part of Duolingo for schools. And then there's tons of headlights lines like this, like millions of Americans are using Duolingo to learn English. Or people in Sweden are using Duolingo to learn Swedish. <laughs> Anybody have any ideas why this might be? 
I heard somebody say it. They're refugees. Refugees, right. Uh, lots of refugee populations um, use Duolingo, in fact, to, um, to help assimilate into their new uh, living situation. Maybe they, they know English, but they're a Syrian refugee now settled in Turkey or in Germany or something, and they're learning. This is Jack doing a quick test to see if anybody can hear me. I unmuted. I will now mute again. Uh, I, I could hear you. May I continue? I don't know if people in the room heard that. Somebody on Zoom just unmuted. All right. So, and Duolingo is, uh, there's mounting evidence that it's effective. So this is a study we had absolutely nothing to do with uh, from 2017, where at least in a, a US classroom K through 12 situation, uh, there was a group of students who took a Spanish course with an instructor uh, and a group of students who just said, it was completely self-guided, use Duolingo to learn Spanish. And after 12 weeks in a post, pre-test, post-test situation, uh, their learning gains were the same. There was no statistical difference between the two. Um, this is a study that we did last year, uh, tracking people who self-reported no experience with French or Spanish. Uh, and they used Duolingo up to the fifth checkpoint, sort of in the curriculum. So I'm like, <laughs> Hello? Was I muted that whole time? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're, you're whole time. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank, thanks for a... Uh... Well, I'm not going to be able to catch you up, uh, <laughs> but I'm sorry about that, Zoomers. Um, so, the, uh, I am sharing my screen with you, right? Okay. Uh, so, it, essentially, like, going about like, a third or halfway through the Duolingo course is equivalent to four to five uh, semesters of university French or Spanish, at least in terms of listening and reading uh, um, skills. Okay. So we're not in the business, though, of replacing great teachers. The thing is, most of the people in the world who want to learn a language just don't have access to great teachers. And so we use technology, and in particular artificial intelligence and machine learning and natural language processing, to create technologies to scale that kind of one-on-one -on -one tutor experience to as many people as possible. And then if you think about the properties of what makes a good teacher, uh, I claim at least that there's three important ones. Uh, one is that they know the material really well. You know, they're experts in their chosen field and, and in the subject matter. They know how to keep you engaged. They know how to make that material exciting and interesting. And thirdly, and maybe most importantly, because of the time that they spend with you, uh, they're able to get inside your head, to understand the things that you know, the things you don't know, the things you struggle with, the things that come easily, the things you've probably forgotten by now, uh, and then kind of engage you kind of proactively uh, with the material when you need to. And so what we've done is we've taken the idea of these different skills and turned them into AI research programs within the company. And so, this is actually a new talk. I'm talking about a lot of new things that I've not really talked about before. I don't know if I've got the timing quite worked out, so hopefully I'll get through everything. But I want to give you a crash course of some of the cool things that we've been doing, particularly in the last two or three years, in each of these three research programs. Uh, so getting started with great teachers who know the material, uh, we use NLP to create internal tools for curriculum design uh, and maintenance. So. One example of this, uh, we, there are some features that don't exist for all the courses, but some of the more popular ones like learning French and Spanish from English or learning English from lots of different other languages, where we've been experimenting with podcasts and uh, Duolingo stories, which are kind of these interactive um, narratives. And because the short form game-like format uh, can only get you so far, so these are experiments in more discourse level learning experiences. The problem is uh, we need to tailor these, the content for these to specific proficiency levels, like beginner, intermediate, or advanced. And this can be a challenging thing uh, for you to do when you're not interacting directly with students, but you're creating content um, for them to use kind of in a vacuum. So one thing that we use as kind of a core reference or, or uh, rubric, I guess, kind of, in our 
course content development is called the CEFR or the Common European Framework of Reference. Who's familiar uh, with this? Okay, so not that many people. Um, but the basic idea is this was developed in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s by the um, Council of Europe as a way, as a standardized way of talking about language proficiency or attainment um, across all, all languages really, but particularly all the different European languages. It's organized into these six levels. There's three like general levels, basic, independent, and proficient, A, B, and C, and then each one of those has a low and a high of one and two. So at A1, uh, that's, you know, you can do greetings, describe people physically, order food and drinks, talk about basic likes and dislikes, like survival skills in the language. Um, but, uh, but very, you know, very basic and, and introductory. And then B2 is where you start to cross that threshold of being a proficient independent user of the language. So you can understand complex and abstract ideas, you can argue your viewpoints, you might still make grammatical errors or have a thick accent, maybe have to do some circumlocutions, but you're, you're a, a good independent user of the language. And so what we wanted to do was build a tool, an interactive editor, uh, that we call the CEFR checker, so that you could paste into this tool you know, any content, it could be something from the course curriculum, it could be a script for a podcast uh, or one of the stories. Here's an, ex an A1 example, you know, she has a dog. Super basic, very easy to communicate. Uh, this is more B2, uh, the furlough scheme will be extended across the transatlantic region until the final days of March. So this is much more advanced. And then to get meta, you know, this is the first paragraph of the Wikipedia page about the CEFR, which is kind of a C-level um, passage. But the thing is, that these are all English examples, but we want to be able to do this for the other languages that we teach too, like Spanish. Again, here's the first paragraph of the Spanish CEFR page, which is also at C-level. The problem is, nearly all the CEFR, and because learning English and, and testing English is a multi-billion dollar industry, there are lots of resources aligning uh, English vocabulary and grammatical concepts to the CEFR, and not so much for other languages. So th this was a, a problem that we decided to tackle using multilingual transfer learning. So what we've got here is a visualization of about 7,000 English words. Each dot represents an English word, color-coded by CEFR level. Uh, and this is a two-dimensional T-SNE embedding of a 501-dimensional space. Uh, this is 500 dimensions in a multilingual language model, uh, plus the normalized log frequency in a corpus. We used uh, for this, I think, open subtitles. And you can sort of see this manifold uh, from the upper left-hand corner, which are the A1 level words, down to the bottom, which are the C level words. And things like brother and apple, you know, those are A1 pretty basic words. And then words like sibling and keen, you know, those are more like C-level words uh, toward the bottom. But then what we can do, this is our training data from English, uh, and then we can project Spanish words into the space using the same multilingual model and then uh, Spanish normalized log frequencies within a Spanish corpus, and then make predictions in the Spanish space. Uh, so, just another way of explaining what I, I just said. We'll take a word, uh, we combine it with the language, the frequency, and use embeddings, and then run it through a logistic regression. And it's, it's not like a softmax regression, it's actually an ordinal logistic regression. So in a binary case, you would project words onto like a one-dimensional logit scale, and there's a single cut of like positive or negative. Here there's five cuts between A1, A2, A2, B1, so on and so forth. Now, evaluating this is kind of hard um, because there's not ground truth reference data for these other languages. Uh, we've done some qualitative studies, <clears throat> or not qualitative, but kind of human ranking studies that shows that we can do a better job of just using frequency at least uh, to do this. But here's some examples for several different languages. Um, and if you're speakers of any of these languages, hopefully qualitatively, like there's a meaningful increase in kind of sophistication as you go from A1 to C2. Uh, what's 
what's kind of interesting here, this isn't really an evaluation, but uh, the, the purple column is the correlation between the output of this system and if you just took all the English words and ran them through Google Translate and propagated the same labels. Um, and it's kind of interesting that, you know, starting using English as the starting point for that, uh, all the Germanic languages are the most similar. And then as you move, you know, into Romance languages, they're less similar. And then as you go into uh, languages from other parts of the world, they're even less similar. So I think that's an interesting result. But here's some examples of stories that were rewritten using this tool uh, at the A1 and A2 level. Um, and so then what we do with almost every product change here at Duolingo is run large scale A-B tests. So we take all of our users, we randomly split them into two groups where one is the control group. In this particular case, this is users who were getting the initial stories that were written when we first started developing the product, which it turns out were written mostly at a B1, B2 level. So they were kind of too advanced for total beginners. And then the other group, we, we gave them those same stories but rewritten using this tool to target A1 and then A2 levels. Uh, and over four weeks, um, there were 40,000 students that were, uh, had access to um, the stories feature. And we saw a 44% increase in engagement as measured by people who did a story on one day and then they came back the next day um, to also do a story. And then we also saw like an almost 4% lift in just all Duolingo users. So like just those individual stories users, just, and I, I believe this was just for French at the time. So only the people in French who were in the A-B test uh, who had access to the stories feature, that was driving a 4% increase overall in daily usage of the product. Uh, so these are the kinds of, you know, business success metrics that we uh, take a look at. There are some others that I'll give in other examples throughout the talk as well. Uh, another use of NLP is for quality control for the course. So if you've done Duolingo uh, and you make a mistake, you know that there's this little report icon. You can push a button uh, and, and say, oh, my, my answer should have been accepted. Right, and that gives feedback to us, like maybe there's something missing in the course uh, that we need to update. The reality is the majority of these reports are junk. <laughs> you know, some of them are just like wrong. You know. um, some of them are random taps. Some of the exercises, you're, it's like magnetic poetry. You've got a bunch of tiles and you tap on them and they just do it willy-nilly. Sometimes, I don't know, people are cut and pasting from Wikipedia for some reason. <laughs> Uh, obvious cheater is obvious. <laughs> I have no idea what was going on there. <laughs> but this is the vast majority of what we actually get. And we get about a half a million of these every week. At least last time I looked at the numbers. It's probably more than that now. Um, and under the hood, this is actually what's going on. So here's a German uh, prompt. And it's a translation exercise. So you're supposed to translate into English this German sentence, which translates, the reference translation is, when I become conscious again, I am in a big room. There's a lot of sublime sentences like this in the German course for some reason. But under the hood, we actually have something, we call this a compact form representation, but it's basically like a, a non-computer scientist friendly version of regular expressions. And uh, there are you know, 17,028 possible correct translations could be maybe that there were 17,029 possible ones and we missed that one. Let's say instead of chamber or room, maybe they wrote space and that should have also been accepted. Uh, so what this tool also, this is the editor uh, that human you know, content maintainers can use. Uh, we also give them you know, a list of these reports that come in and prioritize in some way. And they can look at them and click X to say, no, that, we should ignore that. Or yes, we should accept it. And then go in and manually edit uh, the regular expression to accept it. And this becomes training labels. Uh, and we'll rank by the frequency, the number of times people have submitted this particular uh, suggestion times the probability that it should be accepted according to the model. Uh, so you know, there's lots of data, the prompt, the suggestion, 
uh, ground truth labels. Um, and what we do is we'll take the reference translation, the suggestion, compute some, do an alignment and compute some features. Some of them are just in the language of what was being submitted. Some are kind of like diff features between the two, as well as the user ID, because some users are better at submitting you know, good suggestions than others. Uh, and there we go. And here's some of the results. So uh, what we're looking at here, each dot represents a different course. This is the area under the ROC curve uh, as, uh, as a function of the number of reports. Um, the, the yellow dotted line is if we just use the frequency, like how many people submit this particular suggestion, that gives us, that's better than chance, but it's still not very good. Uh, and the ML models are able to predict much higher. Uh, what's interesting to note, you know, Esperanto for Spanish speakers, maybe not that much better than, than uh, using frequency, but French for Spanish speakers or English for Portuguese speakers is very high. Navajo for English speakers is surprisingly high given the fact that um, we didn't have any training data in Navajo. So there, it's actually able to learn enough about the patterns of kinds of mistakes uh, in the English translations of prompts in language X that we can do a fairly good job of ranking the kinds of reports that come in. And one way that this has really helped us is when we release a new course in particular, uh, you know, this is a beta release, what we're looking at here is the total number of reports that come in. And we want this to decrease over time. And when we graduate a course from beta and say it's kind of like ready for prime time and we'll roll it out into the apps as opposed to just the website, uh, there's a bunch of different metrics, but one of them is, is the number of reports that come in uh, per number of users. Before we built this tool, it took about six months for us to launch a new course to get it to graduate from beta. And then after launching this course, it took just a little over one month. So significant speed ups and gains in the user efficiency, uh, or in the, the content development efficiency. Now what would be even better is if we could semi-automatically generate this gigantic regular expression uh, from scratch rather than having to have humans edit it. <clears throat> and for this, last year we actually had a shared task. So if you're interested in this problem of simultaneous translation and paraphrase, so the typical machine translation problem is given a single input, produce the single best translation. But in our case, we want, given a single prompt, we want the set of all possible valid translations. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so we had a shared task where we released a data set. Uh, we have plans of taking some of the learnings from this and, and building some internal tools to help speed up this process. Uh, I encourage you to check this out and uh, download the data set and play with it continue to iterate on it and write more papers. And this isn't the only shared task we did. A few years before that, uh, we had something we called SLAM, or Second Language Acquisition Modeling, um, which is another kind of more uh, psychometric or cognitive science bent. But anyway, go to sharedtask.duolingo.com. I'm not going to talk about these because there's more to talk about than there is time to talk about it. Um, but I encourage you to check those things out. So to kind of wrap up this first part, you know, there's lots of cool NLP opportunities for improving language education content, like aligning uh, the, the course content to a proficiency standard, prioritizing problems within a course, and kind of automatically translating and paraphrasing the course content um, to speed up content creation. So uh, moving on to the second kind of research program, Great Teachers Keep You Engaged. Uh, let's start out by talking about machine learning for routine building. So if you've used Duolingo, you've probably gotten annoying push notifications to remind you to do your daily Duolingo lesson. Uh, so we use email reminders and these mobile notifications to help users build a daily routine. The thing is, there's hundreds of possible messages that we might send. And so how do we choose? Does anybody have any suggestions? For family of algorithms? The ones that people respond to the most. <laughs> the ones that people, re yeah, the ones that are effective, that get people to come back. Any, have, anybody have ideas of types of algorithms that might be useful for that? Yeah, 
So multi-arm bandits is a good way to start. If you're not familiar with multi-arm bandits, this is a cartoon uh, to illustrate. You know, each one, well, our octopus here, you know, has a bunch of arms. And we could use that to pull different uh, slot machines or one-armed bandits. Uh, so the, the email reminders that we might send are the arms here. We could choose to pull this lever or that lever. We could choose to send this template or that template. Uh, and then there are rewards. So in our case, we decided to define a reward as when we send this template, did the user go and do a lesson within two hours of when we sent that notification? Uh, so we get a reward or not for each one of these things. And then we learn a policy. Uh, basically, for each one of the arms, we assign a score and that score, we, we pull that arm in proportion to that score. All right, we want to maximize some expected reward. There's a trade-off between exploration and exploitation, you know, like trying to pull new levers to see what happens versus keeping pulling the levers that you know that works. Uh, two problems with the typical multi-arm multi bandit scenario for us, though, is one, not every template is always eligible. So some of the templates have to do with, like, your streak freeze, or uh, you know, so and so is about to take your place in the Obsidian League, or, or something like that, in some of the gamification, gamification features, and those only apply if those apply to you on that given day, and that kind of messes up with that messes with how you compute the statistics for the scoring. And another problem is that templates can grow stale. Like if this is a really well performing template, and I send it to you every single day it's probably going to stop working. So we came up with a new bandit algorithm that we call a sleeping recovering bandit to kind of solve both of these problems. So the reward, or the score, this S star UTL stands for the score for a given user, template, and language. And language in this case is their UI language. So I'm an English speaker learning something. This is the, the language here is English. And uh, that is, it's got two parts to it. The first is the relative conversion rate between when this template was sent versus when it was eligible, but we chose not to send it for whatever reason. And that helps us kind of deal with this eligibility problem. And then there's also this novelty bonus, which exponentially decays um, in the time since you last saw the template. So kind of, if you think, Back to the slot machine kind of example, let's say you pull a particular arm, and you get a payoff or not, and then that arm becomes radioactive. And you probably don't want to pull it again until like maybe the half-life has decayed uh, after a while, and then it slowly becomes safe to start pulling again. And this helps deal with this kind of stale or overuse problem. Uh, and, and these two together, uh, you know, we can retrain the statistics for this you know, nightly uh, and, and use this as part of the, the multi-arm bandit framework. And here are some example templates that perform well, like very friendly, hi, it's duo, time for your daily Korean lesson. This works you know, better than the average template, particularly for Portuguese speakers. For some reason, it's even better than English and Spanish speakers. Uh, whereas it's time for X, your X percent away from leveling up on this particular skill doesn't work as well for English speakers as it does Spanish Portuguese speakers for whatever reason. And then just give your brain a boost. Yeah, nobody really responds to that. <laughs> so in this case, you know, we ran an A-B test um, and the, the fraction of users who uh, used Duolingo who then came back the next day increased by 0.5%, which may not sound a lot, like a lot, but when you're dealing at a scale of you know, tens or hundreds of millions of users is still a lot of people. Um, and in particular, and maybe more importantly for new users who are just getting ramped up with the product, so this is people who've signed up within the last two weeks, uh, there was an even higher boost in their retention. Um, and so we launched this product and then things like this started happening. Or hi, it's Duo. Ballistic missile threat inbound. <laughs> Duolingo bird when you haven't practiced in two days. Yeah, so not many people can say that their research has spawned memes, but you can. Oh, I'm sorry, recording people. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so we actually wrote this up. We had a KDD paper last year. We also released a data set if this is a problem that is interesting to you. 
uh, you're, we encourage you to work on it. Uh, we also, in terms of engaging experiences, use NLP to give better feedback. So some complaints that we sometimes get are, you know, Duolingo is great for learning vocabulary, but it doesn't help me understand grammar. You know, it does, it doesn't, I made this mistake. I don't really understand why it was wrong or why this correct answer is the correct answer. So, you know, we, we gave people references and resources, conjugation tables and tips. Nobody used them. Never even opened them. And then if we put in call to action <clears throat> buttons and encourage people to use them, then they quit using the app. <laughs> so this is something people said they wanted, but you know, in a normal product development sense, when we gave them the resources, they either didn't use it, or if we encouraged them to use it, they, they gave up. So the way we decided to solve this problem was to give just-in-time grammar rules as soon as they made a relevant mistake. So in the, in the pre-time, in the before times, you know, in the old Duolingo, if you were supposed to translate uh, I work Sundays into French and you put in je travaille dimanche, you know, you would just get, you know, here's the correct answer. You forgot the word le. And it's easy enough to understand what was missing, but you don't necessarily understand why you were supposed to use the determiner in this particular case. So if that happens with a smart tip, it will trigger, it will, you know, public service announcement briefly interrupts your lesson with a little explanation that, well, you put le before days of the week when talking about things you do regularly. Je travaille le dimanche. And then we cue this, uh, this exercise up again at the end of the lesson so you have another chance to kind of practice that, <clears throat> that particular rule. This is a surprisingly difficult NLP problem <laughs> uh, to solve, but I'll talk a little bit at a high level about how we did it. <clears throat> so let's say the data set, you know, in the logs for a given day, the correct answer is un chien méchant. You know, this is a mean dog. But somebody types in un méchant chien, which is grammatically, in English, a mean dog rather than a dog mean. Uh, or un chat sympa, or un chouette vert, a green owl. You know, so if you're following along at home, you probably see a pattern here. And what we can do is take the correct answers with their corresponding errors part of speech tag them. We also dependency parse and morphologically analyze them, but let's just stick with simple part of speech examples. And then given like this set of correct answers and their transmuted uh, sort of incorrect answers, we can represent these in first order logic and use inductive logic programming to propose rules. Now raise your hand if you had no idea what I meant when I said inductive logic programming or only a partial idea of what I meant. Okay, a few more hands went up. So ILP is kind of like, not integer linear programming either, but um, it's kind of out of fashion today, but it, um, in, in the world of neural networks, but it's an extremely useful symbolic way of inducing first order rules, which why do we care about doing that rather than using you know, the latest greatest uh, deep net? Because we need human language experts and curriculum people to, to understand what these rules are, and also software engineers who are not machine learning engineers to be able to go in and uh, troubleshoot these kinds of things. Um, so this, this first order logic rule you can rewrite as you know, swap x and y when x is a noun and y is an adjective. Or in plain English, you know, swap a noun with an immediately following adjective. Um, <clears throat> and, and we use this then to power for a new session. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, somebody who's remote, can you pop up and tell me whether I'm still there? There's a chat here. Okay, good. Phew. All right, well, I'll power through the rest of it real fast. No. Um, all right, so here's a screenshot of an internal tool that we built. The real rules can be very complicated, like turn T into W, where T is a regular present tense non-infinitive indicative verb that shares a lemma and tense with a non-infinitive indicative verb W that has a lemma that, follows, that matches this regular expression. We haven't even gotten into syntactic governance. You know, those are even more complex rules. but. But basically, the, you know, the people working on these are actually trained linguists. Uh, and there are examples of when this particular rule would fire 
what the correct answer was and what kind of incorrect answer that this would generate. Uh, and then they can use this to take the suggestion that was automatically induced from the data and then refine it if it's not quite right, accept the rule, publish it. And then once the rule is published, the, here's how it gets triggered in the actual app. So I, I talked about these regular expressions before, un chien méchant, you know, maybe other synonyms for méchant are vicieux or mal, uh, and we compile those into a finite state machine. So any path through this machine that reaches the end state is a correct answer. Anything that doesn't reach the end state is an incorrect answer, and we'll throw up a grading ribbon. Well, with this rule, with this new rule now that we've published, uh, what we can do is add arcs to this FST. And now anytime there's a path to the end state that follows the red arcs, then we'll trigger a smart tip right afterward. And again, if something never reaches the end state, then we'll just fall back to give them the grading ribbon to tell them what the right answer should have been. We just didn't have a smart tip to cover it. Uh, and when we ran an A-B test for here, there's a paper still under review for this, uh, we saw a significant decrease of errors for which there is a smart tip that would trigger. I don't know if that exactly makes sense. So not every error has a smart tip that can cover it, but if you counterfactualize by just the ones that do have a smart tip that would trigger for this particular error, those in the control condition with no smart tips uh, may continue to making significantly more of those types of errors uh, than the ones that actually have the smart tips, which is one piece of evidence that they're actually learning how to solve the problem correctly. Uh, or do the translation correctly. And then here are some examples of, uh, of some of the errors. Since we're kind of running low on time, I'll, I'll speed through and move on to a third way that we're using NLP technology to build gauging, engaging experiences, and that's with, that's with speech technology. So about a year ago, we launched a cast of characters. We wanted Duolingo to become the Sesame Street of language learning. So we invented all of these different characters. Um, and after finalizing how they looked and who their personalities were, we wanted to give each of them a voice. Uh, and not only was this kind of fun in a new engaging uh, way of interacting with the language, but it's also good for learning because you can hear subtle variations of the language. So if you have different genders, different ages, different ethnic accents and things like that, um, you can hear the phonemes if we just use a single text-to-speech voice, you run the risk of your ears overfitting to just that single text-to-speech voice. But with a diverse set of voices, um, then you can generalize and actually you know, in, um, internalize you know, the sounds of the language better. Um, so we started this project about a year ago. Here's where we stand for English and French. Most of the characters have their their language is deployed. Um, the, the microscopes mean that we're currently running an A-B test uh, to, to launch them and kind of kick the tires a little bit. The gears mean we're currently building those models or collecting data and the rest of them. We expect to basically be done covering these five languages, which are the most popular languages to learn on Duolingo um, by the end of the year for all the characters. And here's Lily, the sarcastic teenager. Um, here's <laughs> her voice. Hopefully the audio uh, comes through. Uh, here's her voice in English. Same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. Okay, hopefully you can hear that. I turn the volume all the way up here. Uh, in French. Une pint de bière, s'il vous plaît. She wants a pint of beer, apparently. German. Was ist Ihre Antwort? In Japanese. I have no idea what that said, but uh, it sounded sarcastic to me. <laughs> so now, how we built these particular courses, these kind of high resource languages, we actually hired different voice actors for each language to sort of, uh, but, but we cast them to be as similar as possible. And a, a research project that we have moving forward is now how can we take all of these, um, the audio from these diverse sets of languages and use them to build a unified language agnostic acoustic model to then try to bootstrap text-to-speech for Lily for Welsh or Klingon or High Valyrian or Esperanto or, or Swat, you know, Dutch or something. You know, some <laughs> of the, the other languages that are not quite as popular as these. 
Uh, we're also building custom automatic speech recognition technology. So historically, we use third-party speech recognition uh, in the apps uh, just because we were a small startup and it was just easier to do. We also use third-party text-to-speech up until uh, about a year ago. Uh, but now, on our blog post, you can read a little bit more about this. We have an opt-in uh, uh, program for people to share their audio data back with us to build a large corpus of both L2 and L1 data. So L2 comes from learners of a language when they're doing the speaking exercises within the app. And then the L1 data comes from, let's say I'm an English speaker and I'm learning French. Um, I, I'm given a prompt in French that I have to translate into English. Uh, I'm too lazy to type it in. I can hit the blue microphone and just dictate it. Uh, and then we'll also record that and get native L1 or at least um, uh, kind of learning language. It could be that English is still your second language, but it's your pivot language into whatever you're learning. Um, and so this, we, we I, I don't have the numbers right on me, but we're getting lots and lots of fun data out of this and uh, no promises, but we're thinking about maybe another shared task, something uh, with this in the future. So keep your eyes peeled. And then putting it all together, we can do cool things like render audio using our custom TTS transcribe it using our custom uh, speech recognition, align the phoneme sequences, map those phonemes to visemes for custom in-app animations, such as... We each have our own personalities. And we have backstories and relationships. Which help to add depth to our characters. It makes language learning more fun. <laughs> it provides lots of variety for learners to hear. Not just one or two, but many different people's voices. Our own voices brings language learning to life. Get to know our stories. As you learn to read, write, listen, and speak with Duolingo. So all of that was automatically generated uh, using the, the pipeline that we've been building over the last year or so. And it's not quite currently in the app yet, but uh, we're working. It's a multi-team, you know, for lots of different teams throughout the company to get this to, to work in production. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, so in terms of engaging experiences, you know, lots of cool things from push notifications to just-in-time feedback uh, to speech technology that we're using to, to create a more fun and engaging experience using uh, AI. How much time do we have? Um, we have uh, plenty of time. Um, another half hour. Another half hour. Okay, good. I was just doing, I forgot when it was over, I was doing a quick time check. Um, to gauge how much I want to, how fast I want to go through this stuff. Um, so now let's switch gears to like the final, um, the final research program of, of personalization and getting inside your head. And there's there's two main thrusts here that I want to talk about. One is machine learning for modeling forgetting. Now this isn't necessarily something that comes immediately to mind, but when you're learning a new skill. You know, particularly something with language that has lots of facets to it, lots of different vocabulary, lots of different grammatical rules. You know, over time, if you don't use it, you lose it. So how can we model forgetting and, and help to uh, improve, you know, retention, mental retention? Uh, so in the early days, who used Duolingo, let's say, from 2017 before? It's probably a lot fewer of you. Okay, so you, you probably remember the strength meters, the strength bars, which don't exist anymore. But this was the original motivation for this work, uh, even though it's still relevant and still used. But it used to be when you did um, a skill, like all the lessons in one of these skills in Duolingo, there was a strength bar. It would turn gold, and there's a strength meter that would decay over time, and that was supposed to be a prompt to get you to go back and practice. Um, and that was a function of, you know, for any given exercise, it was a function of the statistical model of concepts in long-term memory. So let's say a learner was learning French and they needed to translate "étant un enfant, il est petit. You know, for each one of those words, we could uh, make a prediction of how likely this learner at this time, based on their history with the word, um, how likely it is that they would get this particular token correct in that translation. Uh, and we wanted this to be personalized for each student and adapt over time as they actually learn uh, you know, and internalize the vocabulary and the grammar concepts better. Uh, so the fundamental kind of idea in all of this is the spacing effect. Um, this, 
raise your hand maybe if you're already familiar with the spacing effect. So it's, it's the idea that people learn better if reviews or practices are spaced over long intervals instead of just cramming all at the end. So take note when finals are coming around, you know, just keep reviewing stuff. Whoops, sorry. Um, spaced out over time. And then uh, this was kind of formalized more than a century ago by uh, Ebbinghaus with the forgetting curve. So the probability of a correct recall uh, is a function of two things. The time delta since the last review uh, and the half-life h in memory. So if, if, if you just reviewed something, delta is zero. So there's like 100% chance that you'll be able to remember it because you just did it. Uh, but let's say there's a theoretical half-life of this particular vocabulary word in your brain. After one day, there's a 50-50 chance you've forgotten it. And then after you know, a week, you've almost certainly forgotten it. Um, so that's kind of the basic idea. But there's a related idea of the lag effect. And this is the idea that people learn even better if the spacing between the reviews gradually increases. So the first time re re you review maybe is 10 minutes. Next time, maybe a day, maybe a week, I don't know. But there's some schedule that, where it needs to kind of space out a bit more. Uh, or else, another way to say it is the half-life increases over time with more exposure. So the very first Duolingo model that was implemented before I even got there was based on this flashcard algorithm system uh, called the Leitner system. And this harkens back to the 70s with physical flashcards. So you had a one-day bucket, a two-day bucket, a four-day bucket, an eight-day bucket. And all the cards start in the one-day bucket, and you review them. If you got them right, then you move them up to the two-day bucket, and then you can wait two days. And you review them after two days. If you get them right, you go up to the four-day bucket. After four days, whoops, if you get it wrong, it goes back to the two-day bucket. And that's kind of how the algorithm uh, worked. Well, it didn't take long to notice that you, know, you could if you, if you think of the bucket labels as half-lives, um, then this is like two to the power of the number of times you got it right minus the number of times you got it wrong, which you can then further generalize into anything. You could take not just the number of times right and wrong, but you know, who the user is. Uh, is this a noun? You know, what kind of prefix is it? You know, what part of speech is it? Uh, that's the same as noun. But, so you've got all these different features, and you have a record of this user saw this word at this time, got it correct and incorrect, uh, and you can empirically fit kind of weights. Uh, and this is what we call half-life regression. And as a, as a pictorial representation, this is a real trace of a real user uh, with a particular concept over their first month of using, uh, or at least of seeing the word in the Duolingo app. So each X represents a time they were exposed to this word in the lessons. Uh, the first time they got it correct 100% of the time in those lessons, the second time only half the time, uh, then again 100%. So e the recall rate here is kind of what we're trying to predict. Out of the op number of opportunities in this lesson that they had to get it right, what fraction of the time did they actually get it right? We also know the number of days it has been since they last saw the word, at least in the Duolingo app. Uh, and then we have like feature vectors, you know, the word, the number of times correct and incorrect in the past, maybe what the word is, uh, and there are other things we could add into. And then the idea is to fit uh, weights such that we make a prediction that goes through those x's as as closely as possible. Uh, this is the objective function that we use to fit it. So there's, we want to minimize the error of a recall term. Plus, there's a regular L2 regularization term, pretty t standard for machine learning um, these days. And then what we added was this estimated half-life error term. So the thing is, like, this is a we're using the stochastic gradient descent here in this uh, non non-convex objective function. The idea here was uh, to add like another bit of side inductive bias to try to get the function to behave as much as possible, you know, like an actual half-life forgetting curve. And when we ran some log data experiments, so this is from 13 million user traces uh, over a, a couple of weeks, I think. Um, the, all the blue bars are different variants of half-life regression. The green bars are different 
other heuristics that have been published in the literature. One is the Pimsler schedule. If, you're, if you've ever used the Pimsler method, it's a schedule that they use to introduce and review vocabulary. Uh, the Leitner system, which is, was our, our baseline, and then also just using logistic regression as a off-the-shelf machine learning uh, baseline. The using the word as a feature helped a little bit. It was statistically significant, but it's, as you can see, it's kind of hard to see uh, how much better. Uh, but what really helped was using that additional half-life kind of inductive bias term. Uh, and in fact, those variants of half-life regression were the only things out of anything we tried that was better than just constantly predicting 0.89, which was the empirical you know, recall rate across the entire data set. Um, so it was the only one that appeared to be actually learning anything meaningful. And something we can do with this model then is peek inside the weights of the words, for example, and get a sense of what the model is learning. So positive weights tend to be high frequency words, uh, which makes sense. That's often a, a heuristic for kind of more basic early age of acquisition words, uh, or they're shorter or regular conjugations uh, or cognates between the L1 and L2. Um, there, how do I move this? Out of the way for everybody, sorry. Um, for negative weights, they're you know, lower frequency words, longer or irregular conjugations, or more advanced grammar. So all this kind of makes sense. They're intuitively point in the directions that we might think. Uh, and in this A-B test, you know, our, our control was the, the Leitner system that was already in place versus using this half-life regression. Now it's important to mention there were no other user interface changes. Everything was entirely under the hood in terms of how we selected the concepts that we tried to target for the practice sessions. Out of all the different words or grammar concepts that we could try to, to fit into this personalized practice session, um, you know, we're, we're only gonna pick like seven of them. And they're gonna be the seven that were most informative either by the Leitner system or new HLR. So here we saw about a 0.3% increase in D1 retention, but it was kind of statistically significant. And we got qualitative feedback that, you know, practice has suddenly become difficult again as a good thing. Uh, and there's, this is definitely a huge improvement. So we decided to launch this and everything was great for a little while. And then after a couple of months, we saw things like every day I get on and try to get my skills back to gold and it takes more than an hour because everything went to crap while I was sleeping. And when we started looking at the users who, who posted these kinds of things in the forum uh, and you know, maybe asked follow-up questions about the, the, the particular words they were having problems with, et cetera, it turns out it was these extreme negative weights on the words. So things like rare words, irregulars. So these are things that are difficult on average, but not necessarily for intermediate and advanced learners. So the interesting thing was, if you remember back to the bar chart, you know, these features improved you know, uh, mean absolute error in a statistically significant way, but it wasn't super meaningful. And it turns out what we were actually doing was regressing to the mean. So our goal here was to create a better, more personalized learning experience. But in fact, we were kind of biasing everybody to start to have a more similar you know, experience. It was maybe better than what was there before, uh, but it still, you know, was kind of pissing off the, the intermediate and advanced learners. So we decided to go back and rerun an A-B test after a while, where the control was half-life regression with the word features versus a refit model without using the word features, and that blew everything out of the water. You know, like the number of lessons that went up every day, the number of practice sessions, which is what particularly was targeted by this feature, went up, and overall activity uh, went up uh, day after day by statistically significant margins. So I think the, the lesson here is sometimes there might be a mismatch between your, your evaluation metric, you know, your machine learning function, and actually what the, what the user experience success metric is. So it's very important to kind of think carefully about both of these uh, and make sure that they're all as aligned as possible. And most of the time you don't get it right the first try. Um, but when you're doing research in industry, it's something that's particularly important to pay attention to. 
Uh, this is also a paper we published at ACL in 2016. Again, we released a data set. Um, in fact, I think the best paper award at Educational Data Mining this year used this data set as kind of the, um, the evaluation set for their algorithm. So if you think this is cool, I encourage you to download it and play with it. Uh, and then after we publish this, you know, we come from an NLP machine learning background, not a cognitive science background. So that brought all the cognitive scientists out of the woodwork to say like, hey, you know, here's this review article from the 90s uh, that took 100 different forms of forgetting functions and applied them to, you know, 100, 200 different data sets. And uh, half-life regression looks like this model. And all these are way better models. You know, the work you're doing was so 1885. <laughs> <clears throat> and, and over the years since we did this, like the, the original experiments were in 2013. Uh, we finally wrote it up in 2016. I can tell you that the model that's in production today is still the one that I trained in 2013. Because <laughs> we, you know, we've gone back and, and sometimes we've been able to eke lower error rates or higher correlations. Uh, again, better machine learning evaluation metrics. But those, they just don't necessarily translate into time on task or user engagement metrics. Um, and th maybe the lesson here is the exact form of the model and what parameters in it maybe don't matter as much, at least in our particular use case, in our particular product, in our particular user experience. Um, eking that extra little bit of error doesn't matter as much as you're doing anything remotely like the forgetting curve at all. So maybe we were trying too hard we were focused too much on forgetting, and we should think about some other aspect of personalization. So that's what we started to do a couple of years ago in thinking about not just what are the concepts that we want to target in terms of forgetting, but how do we maximize, make use out of the difficulty, learn about the difficulty of the, of the exercises, and, and, uh, and use that to our advantage. So we built a system we affectionately call BirdBrain, uh, and here's a little bit about why we built it. So there's an idea in educational psychology of the zone of proximal development. And the sense is like when you're learning something, uh, it, there are certain things, certain tasks that are easy. You know, you've mastered, um, you can do them without help, right? And just outside of that sphere is your zone of proximal development. So these are things that you can still do, they're still within your reach, but you might need extra time, you might need a little help, uh, but, but they're not too challenging for you. And, and beyond that is stuff that you're just not ready for. So the idea is you wanna spend most of your time in learning new material, challenged and it, you can increase both challenge and motivation when you're learning in the zone of proximal development, kind of at the edge of your abilities. And what this means for Duolingo is whether you realize it or not, but when you go do a lesson or a practice session, there are actually hundreds of possible exercises that we could try to cram into that five minute chunk of time. And some of them are gonna to be too easy for you and some of them are gonna to be too hard. So we want the Goldilocks effect here. You know, we, we wanna use machine learning to be able to make a prediction of, of um, things that are right in your zone of proximal development. You know, not too easy, not too hard, just right for you. So the way BirdBrain works is we've got a user, we've got a particular challenge. BirdBrain can take both of those and say, you know, there's an 81% chance that this learner will get this challenge correct. Uh, but some other challenge that's way easier, maybe 98%. So maybe we shouldn't show that one because it's too easy. But this other one is way too hard. But that's all for the same learner for a different set of challenges. Uh, for some other learner who's at a different point in their kind of language learning journey, it could be that this challenge is easier, you know, and it's closer to or in their zone of proximal development. And, uh, and so essentially this model is, is kind of like a logistic regression. It's what psychometrics would call a Roche model or a one parameter logistic um, uh, item response theory function, item response function. Um, that's trained on more than half a billion exercises every single day. And because each learner has their own unique profile of the exercises they tend to get right and wrong, um, you know, we, we can learn to make more and more accurate predictions. Like here, when we first built BirdBrain, um, these are area under the ROC curve, kind of learning curves 
for Bird Brain over the first six months or so after uh, we published them. So not only were they high, but increasing over time as more and more uh, people started learning. Yeah, here's where the pandemic hit. Um, and, and just so you have a sense of how long maybe it takes to build something like this in production, we spent an entire quarter kind of getting buy-in and approval to, to build it, uh, building it in the background and kind of like a shadow launch where it was running in the background, but we weren't using it in the product. Then we spent another quarter kicking the tires, fixing memory leaks, you know, improving the data pipelines and whatnot, uh, and finally launched one little A-B test here, or, or we started running the A-B experiment, then the pandemic hit. Uh, we all went work from home, but this experiment was a success, so we launched it. And then we started running more and more A-B tests, uh, more and more optimizations. And slowly, we kept running run more and more exper experiments, gradually integrating bird brain predictions into different aspects of the, the learning experience. And today, it's about 80% of all lessons are based on bird brain in some way. Uh, here's one such A-B test. This is the first one we ran where when you do practice for a particular skill, uh, we saw a 9% increase in content length, so the sentences that we presented to users were 9% longer. Uh, but also the time that they spent learning in the app, so we're not talking about day-on-day -day retention, but like the number of minutes they spent every day went up by 3%. Uh, in a different A-B test, again, we saw both of these numbers go up. A 3% boost in content length for level one lessons, a 6% increase in time spent learning. And it, this might seem obvious or trivial, but it turns out there's kind of a tension between these two things. We've found time and time again with lot, lots of different experiments that there's, there's usually a trade-off between user engagement, how often they use the app or how much they use it when they decide to use the app, you can make things easier and they'll use it more and more, but less useful for learning. Uh, or you can make it more challenging, but then people get tired or pissed off and they stop using the app. But with BirdBrain, each one of these dots represents one of the A-B tests that they ran, we ran using BirdBrain. And there was a positive statistically significant relationship between these two things where there's normally a trade-off. Uh, so we can compare this to all the blue dots that are all the other A-B tests that we ran during the same period of time, but using more conventional product development and software engineering techniques rather than using AI for personalization. And a lot fewer, there's almost no relationship and a lot fewer of those experiments succeeded in improving both. So this was kind of like a major unlock for us in terms of making the content both more engaging um, and more difficult. Some top secret new stuff. Uh, I, I mentioned that <laughs> BirdBrain V1 was basically like a, a giant logistic regression. Uh, we've tried transformers, it does a little bit better. Turns out deep knowledge tracing, which is essentially LSTMs, uh, does even better. Uh, so we're currently deploying uh, a large scale LSTM model. And what's interesting is, so the logistic regression, it's essentially like a two hot vector where there's an indicator variable for the user ID and for the challenge ID. In fact, we represent the challenge using it, some NLP features, but basically you can think of it as uh, the same thing, where they're projected onto the scale uh, and, and the further in this direction, in the positive direction, a challenge is relative to the user, the easier it is versus the harder. So there's one dimension. This can learn hundreds uh, you know, of dimensions for the user and for the challenges. And interestingly, if we use the embeddings that this LSTM learns for the challenges as features to try to predict smart tips rules and whether or not that will trigger, uh, we can do that fairly well, which is some evidence that this neural net based approach is capturing systematic things that are hard or challenging for learners in terms of grammar and, and semantics and vocabulary. So this is pretty exciting ongoing work that hopefully you'll hear more from us in the future. So lots of opportunities for machine learning for modeling forgetting and difficulty. People are, looks like people are getting tired. All right, there is one more section and then we'll open it up for questions.
Somebody want to stand up, do a stretch? <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so bonus. Everything we've talked about so far has been focused on the main flagship Duolingo learning product. But whether you realize it or not, we also have a language assessment product. Um, so here is a heat map showing the coverage in the world per capita of test centers for these three major uh, language tests, you know, IELTS, PTE, and TOEFL. Uh, so lot, lots of good coverage in, ironically, the English-speaking world, uh, and a little bit the Middle East for some reason. And so there's one test center per two million people in the world. However, there is one internet user per two people in the world. So we thought, well, our, the mission of Duolingo is to make the best education we can and make it universally available. Uh, we can extend that mission by having the best educational assessment or certification uh, possible and also make that universally available. So the idea was to create an online, actually, here's, here's what it is, the Duolingo English test. It's available anytime on demand. You can take it on the internet. It takes about 45 minutes. The results are certified within 48 hours and it costs $49. And if you've ever, who's taken any of those other tests in order to study here? All right. who, who really enjoyed that process? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Usually there's one, I, I don't know. <clears throat> um, but the experience is very different. They're longer, they're more expensive, more laborious. The, these test centers are not in every city. People in rural areas you know, have to take a bus and spend the night. Um, Whereas this, uh, our goal here was to reach, you know, much more access. The problem was in the test development life cycle. Uh, so the traditional test development approach is like you have experts who, who write items, and then you do thousands of pilot uh, administrations, and you, you pray that the people that you administer the test to in those pilot administrations actually are representative of the test taking population. Uh, and then you do some psychometric analysis, which is very similar to the bird brain model. Basically, you get kind of parameters of abilities for uh, the pilot testers and difficulty weights for the items. Uh, and then that helps you pick you know, your final set of items, and then you can use those in a computer adaptive or non-adaptive environment in order to score. This is time consuming and expensive. And we didn't have the resources to do it. And furthermore, for a test that needed to be online and on demand, we needed this item bank pool to be huge. You know, we couldn't get by with just 100 items because after you've taken the test two or three times and a few of your buddies have, you've seen all the items and you can build a database of them and it's easy to cheat on the test. So we needed to create you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of these items and be able to know how difficult they were uh, you know, before anybody had even taken the test. So the idea was, can we use machine learning and NLP to bootstrap this process? So what we did was we surveyed the literature and picked various item types that were kind of fun and on-brand and interesting and quirky in Duolingo since. Here's one called the Yes-No Vocabulary Test. It's been around since the 70s. Uh, and the idea is you're, you're given a bunch of words as stimulus, stimuli, some of them are real English words, like frequently or positively or apply, but some of them are English-like pseudo words, like moride and bricken. And your task is to identify out of this set, you know, which are actual real English words. Uh, there's, there's a visual version of it, a written variant, which has been shown to significantly predict reading, writing, and listening skills. There's also an audio variant of it where you hear the, the stimuli rather than reading them. Uh, and that's been shown to significantly predict listening and speaking skills. And so what we did, if you remember all the way back to the beginning of the talk with that CEFR kind of interactive annotation tool, uh, what we can do is take this idea of the CEFR, create uh, the Duolingo scale, mapping that on a scale of you know, 0 to 100, and then project, you know, use annotated vocabulary to, to be able to project English vocabulary onto this scale. You know, so words like box and food, uh, they're, they're short, they're high frequency of Anglo-Saxon or origin, so they're kind of like more basic words, whereas obfuscated and crepuscular, 
you know, these are more advanced uh, Greco-Latin etymologies, lower frequency. Um, so those are more C level words. We can also take this data set, run it through an LSTM, for example, and then generate a bunch of English-like pseudo words, filter out things that are creative and novel, but potentially offensive, and then uh, use the same model to project pseudo words you know, onto the scale. So like Thelf and DAC don't exist, but they look kind of Anglo-Saxon and they're short, and they'd probably be high frequency if they existed. Uh, whereas contributory and we actually had to take the word trumplication out because it's arguably a real word now. <laughs> but you know these are kind of longer, lower frequency kind of uh, Greco-Latin looking words. Um, and so the idea is we have a computer adaptive test that would try to pair Earn and Fantastic against Orego and Invulk, right? And and it would jump around as users, as test takers did well or worse, kind of like a binary search, uh, to zero in on their exact you know, ability levels. And that would then score the test. Um, in, in the models that we, we trained, this is five-fold cross-validation results for these 7,000 English words. Uh, the correlation between the actual human subject matter annotations uh, and the predictions according to this model is 0.9, which is extremely high for any kind of psychometric model, particularly for language learning uh, or assessment. Uh, we also have other item types I'm not gonna go into detail with, but those are longer form kind of passage level, discourse level rather than word level. Uh, we had an analogous passage model that wasn't quite as accurate, but uh, it was still quite good. And then there's a question of, okay, well, if we do this, uh, you know, we, we sidestep this whole pilot testing approach and we use this, these machine learning models to automatically generate lots of items and calibrate their difficulties. And then we run an operational test based on those predictions. Um, after a few years, we had quite a bit of data, people actually taking the test, and we could ask the question of, okay, these model predictions versus the logs of people actually taking the test and we run a more traditional psychometric analysis on those results, how aligned are they? You know, how did, were we able to replicate with this machine learning approach what we would have gotten had we done more traditional uh, pilot testing? And it turns out we could replicate it. It's not a linear relationship, but almost perfectly. Um, the, the Spearman correlation between the two is 0.96. And perhaps more importantly, is okay, the scores that fall out of this computer adaptive Duolingo English test driven by machine learning and NLP, um, how related, what's the relationship of that with other accepted standardized tests? So also uh, over a few years, people who took the Duolingo English test, who also took uh, either the TOEFL or the IELTS could optionally upload their score reports uh, and th this gave us some parallel data on, upon which we could do correlation analyses. And here you can see a 0.74 and 0.75 um, Pearson correlation with the test that we built and these other tests. And it's important to note that the correlation that those two tests have with each other was a 0.73. So basically, all three of these tests are pointing in the same direction, or they agree with each other as much as uh, you know, all three agree with each other equally. Uh, which we take to be quite a bit of evidence that you know, they're measuring the same underlying construct. There's a bunch of other you know, reliability and security metrics uh, that we're, we were able to compute. Um, the test is currently accepted by more than 3,000 institutions, including recently, Carnegie Mellon finally accepts the test. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so here's a quote from Columbia who who now uses it, um, I believe, for, for all incoming undergrads, but they started out using it specifically for a scholarship program for displaced persons. So these were Syrian refugees who by definition you know, didn't have access to a conventional testing center, but who wanted to study um, at the university. So lots of schools kind of dipped their toes into using the test for these, um, the, these edge cases, or student athletes who, because of their their training and competition schedules are unable to, to do conventional testing or people in rural areas or some countries don't even have a test center. Um, so gradually it's grown to 3,000 and um, yeah, 
when the world shut down with the pandemic, this was the only option for lots of people who wanted to study in an English-speaking university. Uh, we had a, a transactions of the ACL paper about this. I encourage you, if you're curious, to read more. We also have an EMNLP paper uh, improving on this using a multitask ordinal regression with BERT features that combines both the subject matter expert annotations and operational test data uh, into a unified kind of logit scale. It's really cool. And with that, I will take any questions. Sorry, that took so long. Yeah, so a, a lot of the experiments that we do are kind of shorter term A-B tests that run for like two weeks to two months or so. Uh, oftentimes, particularly for risky changes, we'll then do a long-term holdout experiment. So for example, the bandit uh, experiment for push notifications, we, we saw some significant gains over the course of that you know, two or three week experiment. Uh, but then after we launched it, there were 5% of users continued to not get personalized notifications. And, we just used a random back um, baseline. And then we ran that for nine months to make sure that there wasn't drift. Uh, and, and after nine months, we saw continued seeing the same results where you know, new users were still up by 2%. And, uh, so we do that uh, quite a bit. Um, and we've also done, we're, we're doing more and more in-house efficacy research. It's just kind of hard, you can't really A-B test that, but we'll, um, and there's mounting evidence that when you get at least a certain depth in the tree, like to checkpoint four or five or something like that, uh, you're, you're able to reach a high A2, low B1 on the CEFR scale. Can the clusters be close to your mic so that the zoomers can hear them? Uh, I'm sorry, and I can repeat the question too. That, in case it wasn't obvious, the question was about the long-term effects. Thanks. Uh, it, it was just a request for me to repeat the question or have the, the askers. Are there any re remote questions? I can't see the chat. Let me see. I was really interested by like, the inductive logic uh, grammar rules that you mentioned. Um, how exactly are you generating like the natural language So the, the question is, uh, with the smart tips, and when we were using inductive logic programming to induce and suggest rules that humans then kind of uh, um, refine, uh, how are the actual, the copy of the tips themselves written? And that's, that is manual. So uh, that's not automatically done. So it's kind of a, a human in the loop interactive process where you know, the, the, the language experts might have a sense of these would be common errors for learners to make, um, but they're still limited in like their own biases and their experience experiences. So we found this bottom-up ILP approach can you know catch the long tail, you know find more systematic errors that are not necessarily obvious to people even with classroom experience, uh, but then they can refine them uh, and and then craft you know the the copy that would go into how to explain this rule. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much, and we can move to the fifth floor of the uh, uh, building. Got a reception. So thank you very much.